to the class. All right, welcome back to Organic Chemistry. We just took our quiz here and we're gonna continue on with chapter six in Solomon. We learned yesterday about, last time about energy diagrams and how useful they are. We learned about endothermic and exothermic, kinetic and thermodynamic. We also learned about nucleophiles and what good nucleophiles look like. You're looking for negative charge or lone pairs, right? And we also learned what good leaving groups were. Leaving groups are better the weaker base they become. So things like HCl, which is a strong acid, means chloride's a very weak base. It's a good leaving group. So leaving group ability is tied to the basicity of the product that is leaving, okay? We also learned that we have nucleophiles can come in and attack a substrate and in a single step reaction, make and break bonds at the exact same time. And we called that the SN2 reaction, substitution nucleophilic by molecular. So both molecules had to be in there at the same time. And so our transition state is the, uh, is the making and breaking of bonds. The other thing we learned in the SN2 reaction is we invert the stereo center if we have one, we invert it because as the group comes in to make its bond, it has to be 180 degrees away from the leaving group. And when it does that, it flips it like an umbrella to give us this. So that stereo chemistry feature is very important. It's stereo specific. It makes one stereo isomer. And we saw that because we had to have both there at the same time, our rate law is a second order rate law and has the, both components are important. So what does the energy diagram look like? Well, the energy diagram looks like this. We have one transition state. We're gonna make and break bonds at the same time. And when we do that, we have these really long bonds here. Notice they're really awkward and long. And notice the three things attached to the center carbon are all in a plane. That's in their process of going from being on one side of the tetrahedron to the other side of the tetrahedron. It has to go through that flat plane. And so that takes a lot of energy to do this, right? So what we're gonna see is that we have our activation energy to get to there is pretty high. And once we do that though, it Take, goes down to our final products. In this case, we're taking the methyl chloride and turning it into methanol, okay? And so since we have this big energy difference here, we're giving off energy, it is exothermic, and we have the nice product we have. Okay, questions involving SN2, its rate law, or this energy diagram, okay? So things that have an energy diagram where you have one peak, your rate laws are typically going to be second order. Rate laws are gonna be second order if you only have one hump, hump on your energy diagram. Okay, so now let's take a little closer look to this inversion of that center, okay? Now, if you have it, if you say it's R, Okay, it's not immediately S because you're switching out one of the groups. So you have to still re go through and reprioritize. But what you're gonna see is that the groups that have swapped in space are the ones that were not substituted. So here we go, we have iodine right here. Iodine's a good leaving group because it's very acidic in its uh, uh, conjugate acids. So we have sulfur here and we learned that that's a good nucleophile too and it's gonna to have to come in from the backside here. It's gotta push this ethyl group and this methyl group out of the way to do it. But when it does it, it's going to be bonded to this side. And notice that the ethyl group and the methyl group are now on the other side. Now, when we reprioritize this, it turns out that it's the same, the, that we're gonna end up with the same uh, prioritization with this being number one and that one being number one. So we're going from cis, from an S to an R or an R to an S. And if we assign that really quickly, we have this in the back so we can go one, two, three. So that means we have the S configuration on this side and the hydrogen's facing back here. So we can go one, two, three. 
and that is clockwise. So we have the R configuration here. Okay. Do we see how we do that? You're getting lots of practice figuring out R and S, right? With those practice sheets. Don't forget the practice sheet to turn in. It's extra credit on the next exam. Okay. So now when we can see that also happening in this case right here, we have the hydrogen going back. And so we have one, two, three. And so that is an S configuration again. We're gonna displace that chloride. And in this case, notice the OH is in the back here. So it's still one, two, three, but we have to rotate it around and it turns into R. Okay, so this inversion happens in all SN2 reactions, okay? Because you're making and breaking bonds at the exact same time. Okay, so let's talk about the relative reactivity, okay? I said on that previous one, when that sulfur, that thiol group was coming in, it had to push the methyl and the ethyl out of the way to make that bond. So what we're gonna see is the, if the smaller the groups on the carbon you're attacking, the faster it's going to go, okay? So if we look at this methyl group here, it only has hydrogens, oops. If we look at this methyl group, we only have hydrogens, okay? So those are pretty small. And so it's gonna be the fastest because your nucleophile just has to push the three hydrogens out of the way. And then our primary, remember what primary is, there's one other carbon bonded to the carbon we're reacting. So that makes it a primary. And in this case, there's a halogen here. So it's a primary alkyl halide, primary alkyl halide. The primary alkyl halide is next because it has two hydrogens, but one carbon group. And then by the time we get to SN2, by, by the time we get to the, the secondary here, we're trying to push two alkyl groups and we only have one hydrogen. So that reacts slowly, okay? So these are fast and this one starts reacting slowly. Yes. So when we talked about steric hindrance last time with nucleophiles, does that also apply to like substrate? Yes, yes, way? exactly. Is that kind of the same idea as this? That's exactly what we're talking about though. Okay. So just like I was talking about the alcohols losing their nucleophilicity as they get so big, we're actually also gonna lose reactivity on our tertiaries. Tertiaries hardly ever react under SN2 reactions. In fact, I'm gonna say never react under SN2 conditions. So there's just too many groups there. The, the group can't come in. I mean, it's, uh, it's analogous to, you know, trying to blow up the Death Star and you have to get the photon through a torpedo, but you had to start a million miles away. It's just so hard to get into that little teeny spot that they can have, that it never happens. So what we like to do is we have the primary and the methyl here react very quickly. They are really good in these. Secondaries are slower, or if the group gets too big, it'll actually not react either. So if you had two big tetrabutyl groups there, it would be effectively a tertiary in its steric hindrance. Okay, so if we think about that, it has everything to do with the idea that we have to have this group, whatever it is, has to come here and start donating its electrons here. So if it can't get close enough to start making that bond, it's going to slow that reaction down or stop it completely. Okay. Questions about that? So let's take a look at that as a function of their activation energies, okay? If we look at the activation energy of a methyl halide reacting, what we're gonna see here is we have a very low uh, energy barrier. Well, we have an energy barrier that goes to products here. And if we compare it to one with two, with this isopropyl group on it, I'm sorry, two methyl groups on it. So this is a secondary and this is a methyl, okay? And in this case here, the activation energy is much higher because it has to push the two methyl groups out of the way, okay? Being that that energy, level, energy barrier is higher, it's going to be a slower reaction, okay? Remember we talked about that, as the activation energy decreases, the rate of the reaction increases. As the activation energy increases, the rate of the reaction decreases, 
Okay, so we can see that just even methyl groups are enough to slow that reaction down. Okay, so that was one thing. And we said we couldn't make the bonds first and then break them because we break the octet rule. So the other thing we have is we can break a bond first. So the SN2, we're making and breaking the bond at the same time. So that means if we're breaking a bond first, we're going to change the mechanism of the reaction because we have to create an intermediate. So it's going to be a two-step reaction. And these reactions are called SN1. Substitution still, it's nucleophilic still, but it's unimolecular because the molecule of interest, the thing with the alkyl halide on it, is going to break the bond with the halide and give us a new intermediate. And then that is going to react with our nucleophile and go to products, okay? So let's look at what that's called and how we do that. So what we have here is the first step is actually the slow step. It has the highest activation energy, okay? And the first step is having these electrons right here leave with the bromine. And what that does is that generates a cation on the carbon and our anion here, okay? So that cation on a carbon is what we call a carbocation, okay? It's the intermediate in this reaction. It's now electron deficient. It is now an electrophile, right? It has a positive, full positive charge. And then it can be attacked by weaker nucleophiles. In this case, we're gonna attack it with water. And remember, we're just using the lone pair from the water to come in and react, I'm oh, sorry, up here, the lone pair from the water to come in and create that new bond. When we do that, we now have a formal positive charge on oxygen because it used its lone pair to make the bond, okay? And then at the end of the reaction here, it's also a fast step. We have water act as a base. It acts as a Bronsted-Lowry base because it reaches out, grabs the hydrogen off of here, leaving its electrons on the oxygen. And so now this becomes the hydronium ion, and this becomes our neutral alcohol. Okay, so the last two steps are very fast. You might not even see this on the energy diagram. Be, uh, you might not see the proton transfer in the energy diagram that happens so quickly. So we're gonna have two humps. We're gonna have that first formation of this, which is our intermediate, and then our second hump, which should have a lower activation energy. Okay. So let's talk about which things would like to do SN1 reactions. Well, it turns out tertiaries can't do SN2 reactions but they really like SN1 reactions, okay? So what we see here is that tertiaries react fastest in an SN1, and methyl groups hardly react at all. Oh, actually, they don't react at all. They don't, so that's kind of weird. So these don't react, but the secondaries and the tertiaries do. That's their favorite reaction to do. So there must be something going on here. There must be a reason, right? So what we think is happening here is that there, well, okay. There must be a reason and let's take roll. That was a horrible place to put that. <laughs> right in my middle of my segue. Okay, so there must be a reason for this, okay? So if we look at the energy diagram, we're actually making that intermediate. That intermediate here is that carbocation, okay? And so there, there's a really big activation energy to get that bond to break. 
And the energy of this is much higher than our starting material. But then our activation energy for whatever is gonna react with it is kind of small, and then it cascades down to products. And this product is out. So that carbocation is a high energy intermediate, okay? So what we have to figure out is we have to make that carbocation as stable as possible. The more stable that carbocation, the lower this activation energy is, and we can do it. So what's gonna drive carbocation stability? Okay. So the thing that drives carbocation stability is by the number of, of alkyl groups you have on that carbon, okay? So the tertiary carbocation is the most stable carbocation. And guess what? That means that it can easily form that intermediate and then that intermediate can react to form. So it forms, it, that's why it does an SN1 reaction because the tertiary carbocations are the most stable. And then secondaries are pretty stable. Primaries and second, uh, uh, primaries and methyl groups are the least stable, okay? So, um, okay, do you believe this? Do you believe the tertiary is more stable? It's on the slide, so you should believe it. <laughs> but there has to be a reason for this, right? So the reason is we have these inductive and hyperconjugation effects that help stabilize this, okay? Just like when we were making acids more and less acidic by having electronic drawing groups here, we actually have the carbocation, when it has three carbons on it, it has a positive charge. So it's gonna make polar bonds between those three carbons. It's gonna pull some electron density in from each of these carbons, stabilizing that positive charge. So it's not a full positive charge anymore, okay? And if we look at the secondary, one right here, we only have two carbons to pull from it. It can't pull anything from the hydrogen. It only had two electrons to begin with and it has a very small shell. So there's no pulling in. So this is not as stable as the tertiary, but it at least has a partial positive charge on that, right? Well, if we go to the primary, we have one carbon to draw from. So it's not as stable as the secondary, but it still had a carbon there. So it's a still a partially positive charge. Once we get to the methyl group, it's a full positive charge. There's nothing it can do. Okay. So if we're doing what we were doing like in delocalization, where the more, the, the less of a partial charge you had, the more stable you were, then we have increasingly decreased our, our, we have decreased our positive charge as we add these carbons to it. So our tertiary is always more stable than our secondary, which is more stable than our primary, which is more stable than our not. Okay, and that all has everything to do with that pulling of electron density through those bonds, the inductive effect. Okay, now I'm gonna introduce a different one called hyperconjugation, okay? In hyperconjugation, what we have is that the shape of the carbocation, it turns out, we've changed our hybridization. When it was bonded to four things, it was sp3 hybridized, right? It had three of all three of the p orbitals shared, okay? In the case of the carbocation, we are now sp2, and we have one leftover p orbital, and that leftover p orbital is empty. There's no electrons in it at all. So because this is a, this orbital here is empty and unhybridized, our sp3, I mean our sp2, the last, the groups that are still in the sp2 are now trigonal planar. And we have that p orbital above and below the plane created by those substrates. Okay. Now, when we have that, if we just have hydrogens, we just have the little teeny, you know, S1 orbitals here. But in the case of having a carbon next to it with an sp3 hybridized bond here, we can actually have the orbital 
donate some of its electron density to that through space. We call this hyperconjugation. So the p orbital is lined up with one of the sp3 orbitals on the adjacent carbon, and that allows it to suck a little bit of electron density in and stabilize it. So just having one there, we have an inductive effect with the carbon and the hyperconjugation effect with the, the bond to the hydrogen on that carbon. So if we just have one, we can actually have like this ethyl cation. It'll bond to one of the three of these because of through space interactions. So that makes this a primary right here. But if we have two of them on here, this isopropyl here, we can do hyperconjugation and hyperconjugation plus inductive and inductive right here. So that's gonna be a lot more stable, right? And then when we go to our third one, we can bond to one of each of those plus the inductive effect, making it even more stable. So the tertiary carbocation is more stable because of inductive effects, how many carbons it's added to, and the hyperconjugation effects because of that overlap between that. But the key feature we gotta remember here is this shape here. We need to know that our carbocation is sp2 hybridized and has an empty p orbital. Because guess what? When our nucleophile comes in, it's going to have to come in to touch one of these two orbitals to come and react. So we need to know this structure. We need to memorize that kind of structure there. Okay. So now we know that secondaries and tertiaries make more stable carbocations than primaries and methyls. And we know that in the SN1 reaction, we have to form a carbocation. That's the first step in the reaction. Okay, so we have a problem. Okay, Math primaries are not very stable. Secondaries are pretty stable, but tertiaries are most stable, right? And they're a lot more stable because they have an inductive and a hyperconjugated effect. And so it, it, it's really kind of almost multiplying it. Well, it turns out that in the case of carbocations, if it can rearrange, it will. Write that down. If it can rearrange, it will. Okay. It will try to become a tertiary carbocation if possible. And it has two ways to do this. It can either transfer a hydrogen, one carbon over, and we call that a one, two hydride shift. We're gonna move a hydrogen. Or we can do it with a methyl group too. But I wanna talk about the hydrogen first. So in this case, I called it a hydride, hydride. Okay, by definition, a hydride is actually the hydrogen with two electrons. It has a filled S orbital and a negative charge. So that's what hydride is. So that means the hydrogen is gonna take its electrons with it. It's unusual, we don't usually, usually the hydrogen leaves it behind when it's acidic, that's a proton. This is a hydride, it takes its electrons with it. So what we'll see here is that we have a secondary carbocation right here, and we have a carbon right here that has a hydrogen on it. And if that hydrogen were to move over, it would create a tertiary carbocation. So that's the driving force. The driving force is it to go from the not as stable secondary to the most stable tertiary. And so what it does is it takes its electrons and it moves over to, it moves them over to this carbon with that, leaving the positive charge on the tertiary carbocation, okay? Now that tertiary carbocation can react with a nucleophile. And these happen pretty quickly. You see it happen a lot, most of them, okay? So, what that means is that we can have rearrangements of our final products. If we did this reaction right here in an SN2 fashion, and we can have ways of doing that, it would actually form our, a different product. It would form this tertiary alcohol because it would start with a secondary carbocation. We do the one, two hydride shift, and then it'd react with the nucleophile, and that would give us this alcohol. If we did it under SN2 type conditions, and I'll show you what those are, 
we would end up with a secondary alcohol and that OH would be on a different group. So we have to be very careful about which mechanism we use and which um, uh, carbocation we start with. Now, it usually have it, okay, carbocations only rearrange to form a more stable carbocation. You don't go from a secondary to a secondary. It's almost always a secondary to a tertiary or a primary to a secondary. Okay, so we're gonna have to look for this when it happens. So in this case here, we have again, a secondary right here. And, oh, look, we got this tertiary here. Yay. Oh, but there's no hydrogens on it. Well, turns out um, methyl groups can shift too. So what can happen here is we're gonna form our secondary carbocation. It's not gonna go this way to form another secondary carbocation. And so what it's gonna do is this methyl group is gonna take its electrons, shift over to generate our tertiary carbocation. This is called the one, two methyl shift, okay? So we can move a hydrogen or a carbon to make the more stable carbocation, okay? It's again, the same mechanism. It just takes its electrons with it to give uh, to the second, to satisfy the secondary carbocation, generating the tertiary carbocation, which is most stable, okay? So when's, when's which going to do? Well, if you have a hydrogen adjacent to make a tertiary carbocation, it's going to do that first. If you don't have a hydrogen, it can do the methyl shift. But you'll look for the hydride shift first, methyl shift second. OK. So it's important to know that hydride shifts are only one carbon over. That's why we call it the one, two hydride shift and one, two. You're not gonna move that carbocation more than once and you're only gonna move it once. And it only goes from your secondary or primary to your tertiary. So here we cannot do a one, three hydride shift. You can't just jump over something to create the more. So if we formed this secondary carbocation, it could move here to give us a secondary carbocation, but no, it won't because that's the same. There's no reason for it to do that. So it won't do that. And it can't go over here because that'll give it a primary carbocation. And we, don't, we know that's not stable. So, and it also can't jump over to try to get to this third one either. So you'll only ever see the one, two hydride shift to make the more stable carbocation, secondary to tertiary, okay? Okay, so there's the last type of carbocation rearrangement involves rings, okay? And in rings, the rings have ring strength. So what they're gonna do is when they have an opportunity, they're gonna do a one, two methyl shift and expand the ring, okay? So if we were to have this secondary right here with this five-membered ring, and we were to create a carbocation here, that's a secondary carbocation. This is a quaternary carbon. If we move one of those methyl groups, it's going to give us a tertiary carbocation. But it turns out it's not gonna move the methyl group, it's gonna expand the ring to give, to relieve the ring stress. So it'll always expand the ring when you have the opportunity to uh, move it. So here's shown stepwise, we're moving these electrons over here and that's where it forms the bond at first. And then we have to rearrange it a little bit. And that gives us our tertiary carbocation and a bigger ring by one carbon, okay? Again, it's only gonna be a one, two shift. The carbocation has to be right next to the center we have and you must be generating a tertiary carbocation when you do it, okay? So, It'll do it in three, four, and five-membered rings. Six-membered rings do not expand. Okay. Uh, let's see. So let's talk about the shape of this carbocation again. It's sp2 hybridized. It's trigonal planar. It has one p orbital that's unhybridized. That p orbital is above and below that plane. Okay. So 
does the nucleophile always attack the top? No, the nucleophile can attack the top or the bottom. Okay, what does that mean to our, what does that mean to our stereochemistry? Okay, we have a 50-50 shot at hitting the top or the bottom so that when our nucleophile is coming in right here to form this, our hybridized bonds are gonna come back out because we're rehybridizing to sp3, okay? And so our substrates are gonna go down creating one stereoisomer, okay? If we were to instead come from the top, come from the bottom here, it's gonna force these up in this direction, giving us the opposite stereoisomer. So which is favored, the top or the bottom? Yes, they are 50-50 shot at each. So what does that mean? That means if we get 50% S and 50% R, we have made a racemic mixture. We have racemized our reaction, which means it's not stereoselective or stereospecific. SN1, stereoselective, one isomer only. SN2, both isomers in equal amounts both isomers in equal amounts. And that's called racemization, making a racemic mixture out of your previous compound. Okay. All right. And okay. So I'm gonna skip Hammett's postulate. Okay. So actually I will. All right. So I will do, okay. So the, what Hanemann's postulate says is that if we look at the transition state of your reaction and we see that the transition state of the reaction is more like the reactants, then you're going to be exothermic. If it's more like the reactants, you're going to be exothermic. So what we'll see here, that's this first curve here. So your reactants are doing something and then they, you move up to your transition state and it's almost like the reactants, but there's something different there. Then we're gonna have our products give us really, really lower energy materials. It's gonna, it's gonna give off heat. However, if our transition state resembles our products, meaning we had to already be halfway to products before we got there. That means we're putting a whole bunch of energy into the system just to get almost there. And this is gonna be an endothermic product or an endogonic product. And so if we have to do so much to our system to make it look like our product before we even start to get to the transition state, it's gonna absorb energy and it's going to be endothermic or endogonic. So, why do I tell you this? Well, we can actually kind of look for things in our system with our SN1. Our SN1 rate determining step is the formation of the carbocation, okay? So that formation of the carbocation actually is controlled by that uh, activation energy to generate that carbocation, right? So if we have a material here and we're getting our, let's say we started with this one with a tertiary uh, and we'll see it kind of climbing up here. It's gonna create the most stable carbocation, the tertiary carbocation. So it's gonna have a lower energy and we're gonna create that. And our carbocation is gonna be more stable than a secondary, okay? So let's take a different material and let's take one of the methyl groups off and so we have to actually have a much higher activation energy because we have the formation of a secondary carbocation, which is higher in energy. And so it has a higher activation energy and it has a higher net energy. Okay, so what does this mean is that the tertiary carbocation has the more stable transition state. The tertiary carbocation has the more stable transition state. But, yeah, and therefore it is faster. Our secondary has a less stable transition state and therefore happens slower and creates an even 
higher energy material. Okay, questions on SN1. First thing you do is break a bond, form a carbocation, then look for rearrangements. Then once no more rearrangements are done, you wait for a nucleophile to come and react. Will be some uh, test question uh, Yes. There'll be a, yeah. What would it look like? Is this reaction SN1 or SN2? Well, let's predict our mechanisms. Let's figure out what we need to know to predict which one it's gonna be. Boy, it's almost like I asked him to say that. <laughs> All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna kind of compare and contrast the difference between SN1 and SN2 and figure out what things affect one or the other. The first thing that has to, we need to do is look at the substrate, primary, secondary, or tertiary, okay? From what I just said about an SN1 reaction being secondaries and tertiaries forming the more, st more uh, stable carbocations, we might start thinking, ooh, SN1. But that's not the only thing we have to look at. The next thing we look at is nucleophile effects. Are they strong nucleophiles or weak nucleophiles? Okay. So that's going to play a role because if you have a strong nucleophile, it probably wants to react pretty quickly. If you have a weak nucleophile, it might have to wait around for a carbocation to form. And then we're going to look at solvent effects. And remember, we have protic solvents, things in hydrogen bond, and non atrotic solvents, those things. So when we're deciding in order of importance, primary, secondary, tertiary, that's the first thing you look at. Second thing you look at is the nucleophile. And that has some determination on it. The last thing you look at is the solvent because that'll help you as well, okay? So let's look at the alkyl substrates first. So the, since this is the most important, we're gonna start with it first. Methyls and primary alkyl halides always do SN2. Let me just tell you that right now. Primaries and methyls always do SN2. So that answers two of your different types right there. That's pretty good. Okay. Um, tertiaries only do SN1. They're too sterically hindered. It has to form the carbocation. Secondaries, however, can do both. And that's where we have to do some work with our nucleophile strength and our solvent. Nucleophile strength and solvent will tell us whether our secondaries do primary uh, SN1 or SN2. So those are the one, that's the one we're going to kind of focus on and look at those effects of secondaries. Okay. Okay. So nucleophilic nucleophile effects. When you have a strong nucleophile, it already has its negative charge. It's going to react fast because it already has the electrons it needs to make a neutral molecule it is going to uh, favor SN2 reaction. So strong nucleophiles, things with negative charges are going to favor SN2. Weak nucleophiles, such as water or methanol, something with just lone pairs, but no charge, favor SN1. Why? Well, I mean, it's not a very strong nucleophile. It doesn't really want, need to share those electrons, right? It doesn't have a negative charge. It doesn't need to share those electrons. So it's waiting till it sees a positive charge to share its electrons with. So your weak nucleophiles are gonna wait for the carbocation to share their electrons with and create that new bond, okay? So, uh, let's see. Okay, so let's consider trying to make an alcohol out of a secondary compound here. And we're gonna consider the stereochemistry as well here, okay? So we're gonna start with this um, cis bromomethyl cyclohexane. So first and foremost, we have a secondary carbocation. I'm sorry, we have a secondary alkyl halide. So we have to make a choice. Is it SN1 or SN2, okay? Now I'll give you a hint at the end, after we've done this a little bit, you'll see you can look at the products and figure out which reactant is in the count. But so let's take a strong nucleophile hydroxide. It has a negative charge. We have a secondary site here. It's going to react to give us that. And what we're going to see is in an SN1 type, in an SN2 type reaction, 
we only get one stereoisomer, right? Because we get inversion of the stereocenter. So in the SN2 with the strong nucleophile, we'll see one and only one stereoisomer. Okay, but if we use water as a nucleophile, it wants to wait around for the carbocation. So it's gonna wait till that bond breaks, that slow step is that bond breaking between the carbon and the bromine to create your secondary carbocation. When you do that, we now have that trigonal planar, that water can attack at the top or the bottom, and it will in a 50-50. So you'll get half of one, half of the other. So what we end up with is two products, <coughs> the cis and the trans isomer in equal concentrations. Okay, so because it goes to that trigonal planar state, the rest of the ring doesn't matter. It's not spherically hindered. It's gonna be 50-50 top and bottom. So just looking at the products, you can say that had to form a carbocation that had to be SN1. Okay, so nucleophiles that are weak are gonna wait for the carbocation. Nucleophiles that are strong are going to just do the direct SN2 substitution reaction. Okay, make sense? All right, so now let's do the last one. This is the least important, but it does kind of play a role sometimes. <clears throat> when you look at these polar solvents and if they are protic solvents, they have a hydrogen bonding proton and usually they have something with lone pairs on them, they favor SN1 reactions because the proton can solvate the anion that just came off. It can fully solvate that anion, the bromide that just came off. And the lone pairs on the, sol on the solvent can help stabilize the carbocation. And a lot of times you can use the solvent as the nucleophile, okay? So that means that our SN1 reactions are really increased in polar, protic solvents. You're solvating the anion given off, you're solving the carbocation you just formed. It's gonna be more stable. You're gonna form SN1. Now, if you have polar aprotic solvents, remember those aprotic solvents don't solvate the bromide ion very well, okay? And it can't solvate the carbocation very well either. So it's gonna favor SN2 reactions. Okay, so protic, hydrate, you know, protic solvent, SN1, no protic solvent, just dipole dipole, SN2. Okay, so those are the three major things you need to remember about that. So let's try, oh. So there's also the last thing, and it's kind of really related to the substrate, is we want to look at the leaving group, okay? Some leaving groups are better than others. And so iodine is better than bromine, bromine is better than chlorine, and chlorine is better than fluorine. So it turns out the substrate, if you have a secondary substrate, only on secondaries again, you are going to have a faster SN1 reaction if you have your iodine versus your bromine. Okay. And it has everything to do with that bond being longer. Okay. So in fact, it works for SN1 or SN2 because that bond is longer. It's more polar. It's more polarizable. So that you can actually break this bond easier with iodine and bromine because it's a longer, weaker bond or you can displace the iodine or chlorine better because it's a more polarized, it's already a longer bond letting you come in with your nucleophile and get them. So in this case, the leaving group effect, it does on both SN1 and SN2. So SN1 had those three things, nature of your alkyl halide, the strength of your nucleophile, good or bad, strong or weak, and solvent, polar protic or polar aprotic. And then leaving group just kind of follows this trend no matter what. Okay. All right. Now, what about substitutions on things like 
this vinyl group, vinyl halide, or this group here? Are we going to see SN1 and SN2 substitutions on these? And the answer is no, because SN1 and SN2 only happen on sp3 hybridized alkyl halide. Only happen on sp3 hybridized. So these are sp2 hybridized. So these do not undergo either one of those reactions. Okay. So when you're looking for SN1, SN2, you don't have to worry about either of these groups. However, if you have the halogen one carbon over from these groups, it actually enhances the reaction. Okay, it enhances the reaction. So in this case here, we're not having the halogen right here anymore, we're having it over here. So that means this a primary allylic carbon. And if we had one here, it would be secondary, and this one would be tertiary right here. So that these two would probably undergo SN2 type reactions, and this would probably undergo an SN1 type reaction. But because we have unhybridized P orbitals that are in that pi bond are going to be next to the unhybridized orbital of the carbocation. That's even better than hyperconjugation, it's conjugation. And when we have conjugation, that makes it even react faster in those reactions than the primary or methyl or the tertiary. So this would react faster in an SN1 reaction than uh, an analogous uh, alkyl halide, tertiary alkyl halide, okay, because of that hyperconjugation. And the same thing happens in benzene, because in benzene, we have six of these orbitals going all the way around the ring, and it can hyperconjugate with those. Okay. So it can react, and it causes it to react faster. However, primaries and secondaries usually do SN2 unless they're sterically hindered. The tertiaries are always going to do SN1, do the ster. All right, questions on that? So this is the last uh, set. This is a special group of things that actually even reacts faster than tertiaries. Okay, so predicting things. All right. Let's look at the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at our substrate. If we have a methyl, a primary, or a secondary that's not too big, it's going to do SN2. Primary, secondary, methyl group. Uh, secondary, it's not too big, it'll do SN2. Now, that means that all the tertiaries are going to do SN1. So just identify primary, secondary, tertiary. Now, some secondaries will undergo SN1, but we have to look at the next step. The next step would be what the nucleophile is. In the case of this, in the case for almost all of SN1 reactions, we have weak nucleophiles or nucleophiles that are are, are solvated by the solvent. In the case of SN2, we usually have strong nucleophiles and they're in high concentrations, okay? Because remember our rate law is a second order rate law and the concentration of the nucleophile is important. So, and then solvent, if we look at solvent here, polar protic solvents are gonna favor the SN1 reaction. Polar aprotic solvents are gonna favor the SN2 reactions. And no matter which way we go, iodine's going to be a better leaving group and fluorine's going to be our worst leaving group. So, yes. How would, how would you approach like mean to start with like question? Like, would you do like an if and or like look at all of them together? Uh, we would start with the, here, actually, let me, let me, let me switch over to this right here. Let's do a problem here. Uh, actually, let me change this. Let's work through a couple problems and figure out how to use that, okay? Uh, okay, let's look at this first one. Is it gonna do SN1 or SN2? SN1. 
and SN2 because it's a secondary, okay? So this could do SN1 or SN2. So we need more information. Okay, what about this one? SN1 or SN2? The bromine is a primary. It's a primary alkyl halide because it's on a primary carbon. It's primary SN2. The bromine is on this carbon here. That's a primary alkyl halide, right? Okay, let's look at this one here. What's it gonna do? It's gonna do SN1. All we did was look at the alkyl halide. Now this one, we need more information. The first one, we need more information because it's a secondary. Okay, let me give you more information. And we're gonna do, um, we're gonna do that with CN, which has a negative charge on it. So it's probably a good nucleophile in acetone. Which reaction is it gonna do, SN1 or SN2? We have a secondary substrate, we have an aprotic solvent, and we have a good nucleophile. It's gonna give us SN2. So we're gonna end up with CN right here on there. Okay, what if we did methanol as the solvent and as the nucleophile? Methanol strong nucleophile? No, it's neutral, it has lone pairs, so it is a nucleophile. So it's gonna do SN1. And our product is going to, let's see, be that. Why is that product that? It's not on the same carbon that the bromine was on. One, two hydride shift. We have a hydrogen here. When it forms the carbocation here, we have a hydrogen to do a one, two hydride shift. And therefore the hydrogen shifts over here and we have our carbocation here and our final product is there. How okay. is it once you well, the hydrogen was here, right? And we're gonna move it to over here and it's gonna take both electrons with it. So we're going from the one carbon to the two carbon. We're gonna move one carbon over. It, it's not the naming one, two, it's just that we're starting on one carbon and we're moving it over. So what happens to the methyl? The, the, both methyls are still here. And the hydrogen got moved over here. Okay. So the thing to do here is look at your type of alkyl halide first. That's gonna tell you a lot. Then when you get to your secondary alkyl halides, start looking for more information. Nucleophile strength and then solvent in that order. Alkyl halide type, nucleophile type, solvent type. Okay. So that being said, okay, yeah. Uh, let's go back to this one. All right. So that's how we would use this here, okay? So let's compare it again, okay? SN2 is a one-step reaction, bimolecular, second order rate law. We always get inversion of configuration and methyls and primaries always react this way and secondaries can if they, under the right condition, but tertiaries are unreactive. SN1 is a two-step reaction with carbocation intermediates. That makes it unimolecular, which has a rate law of order one, you have to look out for rearrangements. Anytime you form a carbocation, look for rearrangement. It changes, it racemizes all of your stereocenters. It's all tertiaries and some secondaries. So secondary is the one you gotta do a little bit of practice with. And there's a lot of practice in the homework for this, by the way. Now, if we look at it here also, so in summary, 
Methyls and primaries only do SN2. Okay, now lilics and vinylics can do either SN1 or SN2, depending on what type they are. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, neither, but sorry, vinylic, not allylic. The vinylic, anything, these don't have the right hybridization. They are sp2 hybridized, they do not do these reactions. Okay, so the secondary can do both. The primary and the secondary benzylic can do both. Why? Why can the primary do both? It has extra stability for its primary carbocation. It has extra stability for its primary carbocation. It can make a primary carbocation. So it can do both. And of course, with this, if you have a strong nucleophile, it's going to do SN2. If you have a weak nucleophile, it's going to do SN1. Tertiaries always do SN1, and tertiaries always do SN1. There's just no, it's sterically too hindered to ever do an SN2 reaction. All right, where are we? Oh, almost. All right. So this SN1, SN2 reaction can actually give you a range of products. It all depends on which nucleophile you're using. If we use hydroxide, we make an alcohol. If we use an alkoxide, we're going to make an ether. If we use a, a, a thiolate, we're going to make a thiol. If we make the sulfur salt of the, the, the thiol, you can make a thiol ether. Cyanide makes a nitrile. If you have this as your nucleophile, you take it to deprotonated uracetylene, and it's going to make an alkyne. You're making a new carbon carbon bond. Acetate, you're going to make an ester. An amine, you're going to make an amine salt, a quaternary ammonia salt. An azide, you're going to make an azide. And then this can be reduced down to give you an amine. So you get all these different functional groups from, this, from these two reactions. So it's a very, very powerful set of reactions. OK, so I'm going to stop there. And we are going to pick up with elimination. E1 and E2, and that's really kind of part of the next chapter anyway. So I'm going to pick up with that after spring break. Please come back to me safely. Please come back to me safely. All right. I'll see you guys later. I'm going to stop recording. We have test two at that Wednesday, right? spring break. No, it's the Monday. It's, no, it's the, it's the Monday after the. It's a whole week after.